but we have a large um, number of patients uh, who have had uh, emergency surgery, liver transplants, aortic surgery, um, and um, they have large operations through very large incisions through the front of the tummy. Um, and depending on uh, the patient's physical state, their nutrition, any drugs they take, um, the nature of the surgery and whether it was an emergency, uh, whether there was contamination and whether the su patient suffered um, with a post-operative issue such as a dehiscence where um, the bowel, sorry, where the abdominal wall um, repair might give way, um, then patients can then end up with the wall of the abdomen giving way uh, and splitting um, through that uh, through that wound. Uh, and this can manifest as a really large bulge um, and uh, that bulge can contain any number of organs or simply fat, uh, depending on um, how large the patient is. Uh, and these massive hernias are um, mechanically quite restricted patients. Um, I had one patient who reported that every time she walked up the stairs, she would bang her bowel on her knees, which she found really disconcerting. Um, patients are unable to lift up um, heavy weights. And again, another patient um, described not being able to lift his four-year-old son. Um, so it restricts activities. They can cause pain. Um, when they're a relatively um, small size defect and a large amount of organs are passing through them, particularly the bowel, that can cause symptoms of pain and tenderness, obstruction, um, which makes uh, uh, patients um, experience nausea, vomiting, bloating. They're unable to open their bowels um, and uh, feel generally unwell. Um, and um, it's difficult um, for patients with a, a large defect in the front of the tummy to um, go to the toilet, for instance. Um, so bearing down can be a, a really difficult manoeuvre, uh, which can lead to um, constipation. Um, well, these are quite large procedures um, and uh, ra ranging really anything from two to six hours uh, to complete. So it's quite a, um, a thing to go through. And of course, um, we try to ensure that patients are safe for the procedure by um, uh, ensuring that they go through a preoperative assessment clinic, which should pick up uh, any um, potential issues. Um, but uh, in particular, one of the things that we know uh, affects the longevity of the repair um, and stops it coming back would be to lose weight. That makes um, completing the procedure much easier. The risk of complications is much less um, and the rate of recurrence is much less. For instance, uh, if the patient's BMI is less than 32 um, as a maximum. So Losing weight is really important before the procedure, if possible. Um, and uh, sometimes we refer patients before doing our repairs to a bariatric service so that we can address that. Um, it's also important that um, if patients smoke uh, or vape, they should stop um, six weeks, uh, at least six weeks before the procedure. Um, and uh, we know that there's an increased risk of um, smoking and um, infections uh, uh, to the wounds. Um, so that's another uh, important recommendation. If patients are diabetic, um, we try and um, optimize their diabetic control. Again, this can affect the repair uh, and um, in particular infection rates. Um, and you can see that one of the biggest things that we worry about is, uh, is infection. Um, particularly um, according to um, some of the meshes that we use, uh, that should they become infected, um, we may not be able to um, sort that out. So that would um, involve a further operation to take out a mesh, treat the patient with antibiotics, and then we'd have to then um, repair the hernia again in a slightly different way. Um, so that complicates things. So 
it's in both of our interests, both as a patient and a surgeon, um, to agree that uh, weight loss, diabetic control, uh, and smoking are all addressed. So an abdominal reconstruction uh, is always performed under a general anaesthetic. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a very long procedure, so uh, we prefer that people don't um, lie on our operating table for hours whilst they're conscious, even if they can't feel things. And because of the nature of the procedure, uh, we like to um, ask our anaesthetists uh, who are helping us to um, give uh, things like muscle relaxant and uh, paralyze the patient during the procedure to help with the reconstruction. And this really can only be done under a general anaesthetic. Um, we, uh, we normally um, approach the uh, hernia um, through uh, a previous incision and sometimes tidy up the old incision and excise old scar. And um, the usual procedure, although there are, um, there's a variety of complexity and a variety of, uh, so according to the grade of the hernia would dictate the grade of the operation. Uh, and some of them are larger than others, as I've alluded to. Um, some of the procedures only take a couple of hours. Some of them take six hours. And they involve um, generally forming a pocket in the the patient's intra-abdominal organs and packaging away a mesh into that space uh, and then closing the abdomen on top and uh, usually some sort of release to allow that closure is required um, to cover the defect and um, we always use a mesh because we know that without a mesh 50 percent uh, or around uh, sorry it reduces the risk of recurrence by about 50 percent um, but um, one of the jobs of the surgeon is to then choose an appropriate mesh for the patient um, and there's a wide variety uh, available uh, on the market I have my um, my favorite few um, generally I prefer to use a synthetic mesh because it lasts longer um, and uh, is easy to um, uh, easy to use and to trim. Um, is complex abdominal wall reconstruction painful? Um, the yes, the answer is yes. Um, it is quite a painful procedure. Uh, we take steps to ameliorate that with um, things uh, like uh, epidural anesthesia. Uh, or patient controlled anesthesia and um, wherever possible uh, because it's a major uh, operation I like to um, I like patients to um, stay on our high dependency unit wherever possible uh, for a couple of days and then I find generally that uh, after a couple of days um, that suddenly the pain seems to get much better um, and uh, people um, normally describe being able to um, be much more mobile, they don't take as many painkillers, and uh, we can then do away with um, adjuncts like um, the patient-controlled anesthesia, uh, analgesia, PCAs, um, and uh, patients then often just go on to a regular oral um, uh, medication regime that, uh, that seems to control the pain really well. Well, um, again, the uh, the risks involved in abdominal wall surgery are quite varied um, and uh, really are different for everybody. Um, some uh, abdominal wall um, surgery is really very straightforward uh, and literally just involves the abdominal wall. Um, but sometimes we have to consider um, the passage of tubes through the abdominal wall, such as stomas um, and um, uh, also considering previous scars uh, so that um, the blood supply is maintained to the abdominal wall. Um, we often handle the bowel. Patients um, sometimes uh, describe obstructive symptoms um, and therefore whilst um, we're dealing with the abdominal wall reconstruction, um, we like to mobilize the entire length of bowel to free it from any adhesions from itself and particularly from the abdominal wall to faci facilitate the, the, um, the repair. Um, so in handling the bowel, sometimes 
it goes to sleep afterwards in about 50 percent of patients they'll experience the bowel going to sleep which is called an ileus uh, and we just nurse people through that um, uh, with uh, conservatively with um, fluid support um, and uh, the advice to chew chewing gum sometimes if it's a prolonged ileus and the bowel uh, isn't working for some time i.e a week um, then there would be um, a plan to start feeding the patient through a vein uh, until that picks up again. Now in handling the bowel uh, extensively and bearing in mind that uh, patients have had previous operations and are likely to have extensive adhesions, there is a risk that we can, uh, or I can tear the uh, outside lining of the bowel, um, which can cause it to adhere to another structure um, and even to fistulate into another structure. And that means that uh, an abnormal connection um, occurs. Um, and um, there is a risk of making a hole in the bowel and damaging the bowel such that the patient would require either a bowel resection and then a joint um, or potentially a temporary stoma to isolate the hole. Um, and we think that something like 7% um, of these cases or up to 7% of these cases can be complicated by a fistula, um, which is quite high. In my own practice, um, I think it's less than 1%, um, but uh, it's uh, certainly a consideration and um, bowel injury is something that we take extremely seriously. Where it's to happen, it changes the face of the operation slightly and that um, the, the mesh selection uh, changes um, and uh, we would then switch to a biological mesh rather than a synthetic mesh um, because uh, it's much easier to rid the patient of an infection um, in those circumstances. Um, of course, recurrence is a, a, a big problem um, and we quote up to 15% um, of patients um, would, ex would have to come back and have a further procedure. And of course, every time we perform a procedure, the follow-up is a larger and larger thing. So um, it's, uh, it's um, something, uh, it's a really important consideration. Uh, it's important to choose the right operation in the first place and the right mesh. Um, other risks include ischemia or a lack of blood supply to the bowel wall. Um, patients sometimes complain of a loss of sensation to the front of their tummies. Um, I, I wouldn't say routinely, but not uncommonly, we um, remove people's belly buttons uh, and that can cause uh, quite a lot of anxiety. We, um, we discuss that with patients um, prior to the procedure. Uh, and sometimes when a plastic surgeon is involved, we may agree to try and refashion uh, a belly button in the, uh, in the tummy. Um, bleeding seroma, hematoma um, of the um, superficial space or just under the skin and the fat is not uncommon um, and uh, represents a real nuisance. We um, arrange for patients to come back to have those um, aspirated and sometimes leave a drain into that space. Um, and um, Uh, well, after surgery, I um, uh, and I, I actually advise this with most of my patients, whether they've had a, um, an inguinal hernia or an abdominal wall hernia uh, repair, is that I anticipate that um, when they're discharged from hospital, they are going to be fairly sedentary. So I like people to wear something called TED stockings or flight socks uh, for at least a week or two until they're a bit more mobile. I like patients to um, uh, try and stick to um, drinking a couple of litres of fluid a day to make sure that they're well hydrated. Uh, and the two of those things um, uh, will prevent clots um, and uh, other um, problems with the blood. Um, and um, I think that's uh, really important whilst they're building up their mobility and uh, convalescing afterwards. Um, I also advise um, that patients wear a surgical binder um, for, depending on the size of the repair, three to six months uh, for as much of the day as humanly possible. Uh, obviously, in summers like we're having at the moment, that's uh, a bit mean. So I, I um, 
uh, close my ears and let people take them off at night, but um, try and encourage people to wear them through the day. Um, and uh, that really helps with support and with closing down any potential spaces that might be uh, that may then fill up with fluids that helps uh, with things such as seromas that uh, I've mentioned previously, um, as well as helping the repair um, uh, take um, itself. And then really apart from that, um, I um, prefer patients not to get back into the gym for quite some time, uh, if ever. Um, and we um, advise people on an individual basis as to what they can and can't do following this procedure, depending on what they were doing beforehand um, and uh, what they would like to do afterwards. Uh, well, I think given the magnitude of the operation, I, I, I normally advise people that they're going to feel a bit like they've had an argument with a truck for about six months. Uh, and of course, uh, straight after the operation, people feel really tired and fatigued and um, uncomfortable. Uh, they will, as they do more naturally, uh, start to experience more twinges and discomfort, but that settles down quite quickly as the scar tissue softens up. Um, but uh, as I alluded to before, I think that um, um, performing um, exercises in the gym and trunk exercises and uh, endurance type um, uh, activities are probably out for about six months. Um, and um, I think that uh, the fatigue generally starts to get much better after about two to four weeks following the procedure. Um, but people should expect to feel tired, you know, and if you're going for long walks, then at least plan your route, have a bench to sit on and just take your time. Um, I don't like uh, people to do um, very heavy lifting for, again, about three months afterwards. I'm quite happy for um, stretching exercises and sports like golf and Pilates and around three months. 